David. Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. It is beyond our understanding. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness, and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. And we thank God and bless him for his word. Let us come and worship him in, in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it is a wonderful thing that uh, we should be able to praise you in the reading of words that were written thousands of years ago, but which are still relevant today. We thank you, Lord, that uh, in the generations since David and the generations before David and the generations that will go on from us, that your praise will still be lifted up to the heavens by men and women who worship you. Men and women to whom you have revealed yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. Men and women whose hearts you will open by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you in praise and worship of your name. Knowing that you hear us. Knowing that you listen to us. Knowing, Lord, that you care for us. And that you have expressed that care in so many different ways in our lives. 
but we can testify of it. But much more so, Lord, of the care you have shown us in the forgiveness of our sins through the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. We thank you that we have peace with you, that we are reconciled to you because of his death, because of the faith that you have placed in our hearts to believe in him, to know him, and to recognize that he is the very image of yourself. How can we know you, O oh God? You are far above us. You are spirit. We cannot see you. But yet, you have made yourself known to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have made man in your image. But your son came in our image to die for our sins. And to rise again. To give us the hope of salvation. So we thank you, Lord, that uh, from the very beginning, when you first made man, when you first made Adam, you have made yourself known to us. And we thank you, Lord, that we have your word today, which speaks to us of you. And when we read it, causes us to turn our hearts uh, towards you. And so, Lord, it, uh, uh, it is with gratitude that we come before you today. We thank you that in these moments uh, uh, we turn away from the world and we turn, away, uh, turn to you and take comfort in your presence. Draw strength from your grace. And strength, Lord, from the fellowship of one with another, knowing that we are not alone. Your spirit is with us. And you have placed us among friends, among fellow believers. And you have given us the faith to understand and to believe that uh, even though we cannot see them, we are surrounded by a, a great cloud of witnesses of those who have gone before us and who are with you in heaven, worshiping. We thank you, Lord, for those who went before us and who wrote these scriptures under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for those who have gone before us and wrote so many hymns in your praise. And that we too can join in your praise with them. We thank you, Lord, that throughout this country and throughout the world, there are many, many people who are worshiping you, who are lifting their hearts to you and lifting their voices to you and blessing you for their salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship in you, in spirit and in truth. So Lord, as we continue in our worship, uh, we ask that you continue to speak to our hearts, that you continue to draw our attention to yourself, that you give us grace and strength uh, to meet the, the needs and the demands of the week ahead, that you give us the grace and strength to 
meet the challenges of uh, today, as well as prepare ourselves for those that will come tomorrow. But we thank you, Lord, that it is today that we meet with you. It is today that we are gathered uh, before you. And we thank you that tomorrow, when we may be on our own, that we will still be together, drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, united together in our belief and in our faith and in our worship of you through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray, Lord, for our fellowship. We pray that you will continue to bless us, that you will continue to teach us, that you will continue to guide us through the preaching and teaching of your word. And we pray, Lord, that, the, that your word will be heard beyond this building and beyond the buildings uh, of the churches and fellowships uh, in which fellow believers meet throughout this land. We know, Lord, that ultimately all flesh, all mankind will bless your name. All mankind will bow uh, before your throne. But right now, Lord, we know that there is so much uh, apathy and indifference to you, so much ignorance of you, so much deliberate turning away even from you. We ask, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy on our country, on our family, on our friends, and on our neighbors. That your saving grace may be made known to them. That they may join us in worshiping the one true living God. So, Lord, we thank you and we bless you. And we draw together before you as we say together the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want us uh, to turn uh, to the epistle of Peter. Um, if I can find it myself. The first epistle of Peter. Um, we are, I'll just read the first five verses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatea, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time.
I'm going to look uh, at uh, the first two verses uh, this morning, and this evening we look at the uh, the third, fourth, and fifth verse of this chapter. And uh, as it says on our notice sheet, uh, I'm going to look at, uh, this morning under the heading of uh, elect sojourners for obedience and sprinkling and sanctification of the spirit. Not anything that you haven't or that we haven't heard before, uh, but worth looking at again and worth remembering. I've uh, looked at this passage a couple of years ago um, and was amazed at how much more uh, I learned from it uh, as I looked at it again. And I like Peter's epistles. Uh, I like the way he has purpose in his writing. He seems to lay out the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. He writes on how to live as a Christian from his own experiences, but of course, this is based also on the teaching that he received as a, as a disciple and an, as a, an apostle of Jesus himself. In fact, Peter introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And later in chapter five of this epistle, he refers to himself as a fellow elder. He was taught by Jesus. He walked and talked and ate and traveled with Jesus as they walked through Galilee and Decapolis, Samaria and Judea throughout the duration of Jesus' ministry. Peter was rebuked by Jesus, but he was also one of the three apostles granted the immense privilege of witnessing the transfiguration of Jesus on the Mount. Peter was the apostle who preached with such clarity at Pentecost. Uh, when under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, under the power of the Holy Spirit, over 3,000 people were converted on that day of Pentecost. Peter was also writing about the relationship about the, of the three persons of the Trinity and their relationship with the people of God. And it is on that that I want to concentrate our attention this morning. Peter does not talk about himself. His concern is for the people who are living their lives day by day, out and about in the world. He recognizes their need for guidance, for understanding and discernment, for leadership, and assurance, people just like ourselves. In these first two verses, Peter addresses his readers as elect, temporary residents of these regions. In the original Greek, the word for pilgrims that we have here, or exiles as it is translated in other uh, Bibles, is better translated as sojourners or temporary residents. People who live their lives every day in these places, but who understand it is not their permanent home. Peter's reference to the dispersion or diaspora is a reminder that as Israel was dominated and conquered by Assyria several centuries beforehand, before Peter was writing, so the world of today is dominated and overwhelmed by sin. The people of God are scattered throughout the world, but this world is not their permanent home. The reference to the dispersion is also a reminder of the many promises that God has given us throughout scripture of the day that will come when he will once and for all, gather all of his people to himself. 
And in the following chapters, Peter will be discussing suffering as Christians and how Christians should conduct themselves in their, in their relationships. But first off, he reminds people of who they are in their relationship to God. And I want to do that by examining Peter's words in these first two verses to see how important these truths are to Christians wherever they are in the world today. They, they were equally important at the time of writing because they contain vitally important truths we all need to remember today. Truths that we need to think about, to ponder on. And 2,000 years ago, the world was hostile to the gospel. And today, it is no different. And we may not receive outright hostility, but we may receive indifference or apathy, which can be just as harsh and as hard to deal with. And it can leave Christians feeling isolated and dislocated. And even in this modern world of communication and technology, we can still feel isolated and vulnerable as these early Christians probably did in these far off regions. So the first order of the day for Peter is to address this situation. And he does so by doing what we are doing today and directing our attention to God, almighty God our Father in heaven. Peter tells them they are status before our Heavenly Father. The status that God has given them. He tells them that they are elect, that they are chosen of God, chosen by God, chosen in eternity past, before the world even came into being. And this is what is meant in verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God the Father who sees everything from eternity past into eternity future. Has ordained that each chosen person. Who has been. And will be included in the people of God. That's huge. Who can know the mind of God? Consider this. God has not just chosen a group of people. He hasn't just cho chosen a tribe, a nation, or even all those people who live within, within a particular geographical area. He has chosen every single individual he desires to bring into a personal and intimate relationship with himself. He has chosen each individual person on whom he has set his love. That's what elect means. The Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle John, I'm sorry, wrote in his first epistle, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. We love him, John went on to say, because he first loved us. And perhaps we maybe can just begin to grasp the majesty and the grandeur and the greatness of our God when we consider what Peter writes in verse 24. He says, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. Peter is quoting from Psalm 103 and Isaiah 40, and the whole of mankind is described as grass. Each person, perhaps, has a single 
blade of grass. Everyone seemingly exactly alike. Nothing to differentiate one from another. Nothing of character. Nothing of interest. Just a great green swathe of sameness. That's grass. And grass is great fodder for cattle and animals of all shapes and sizes. And who in this country, apart from farmers, gives any value to grass? And if you know me, you might know that I quite like grass myself. And I like my lawn. But that's it, it's a lawn. I don't look at the individual components of that lawn. And farmers, they don't place value on a single blade of grass. They value grass by the acre or by how much it takes to fill a silo. And here the psalmist is saying that the glory of man looks like grass. The glory of man is nondescript. It's brief. It's fragile. So fragile that the wind passes over it and it is gone. The psalmist who wrote those words was King David, who as a boy and as a young man shepherded the flocks of his father, Jesse. And he probably thought quite a lot about grass. He certainly valued every bit of pasture he could find for his sheep, I'm sure. But he also thought a lot about God. And in that same psalm, he went on to write, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. So consider, consider the magnitude of the love of God. Consider the greatness of his power when we remember what is most valuable to him, his people. That's who is most valuable to God. Now I want you to imagine a farmer who wants to create a special lawn in his private garden. And he decides in himself that he's going to achieve this by collecting individual blades of grass from all of the fields that surround his farm. Imagine how he would need to harvest each individual blade of grass, including its roots. Otherwise, it's not going to survive. Imagine in doing that, how much care he would take to ensure, not just in the gathering of each blade, but in the placing and the transplanting of each blade in its new place. Well, such a feat of workmanship, such patience, such dexterity, such skill on a human level is beyond my understanding. It's beyond my imagining. But if we can imagine it, we still cannot grasp the scale of what God has undertaken to build a people for himself. The Bible teaches us that in eternity past, before the universe had come into being, Almighty God chose from every individual tribe, from every nation, in every generation, and throughout every age. He picked out by name every individual person who is included in his plan of salvation. And what's more, Jesus assured us that God the Father not only knows each individual person, but he knows the number of hairs on the head of each person, each and every one. But comparing the awesome power of God to anything man can do, I think, is a, a futile exercise. God is the creator. He is beyond compare. 
To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? Asked Isaiah. And we can only answer as Job did when he was confronted with a similar question. I know that you can do everything and no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. How great is our God. How marvelous that such a God should set his love on man. As King David also asked in Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet of all his wonderful creation and all the creatures in it, man is the only one God has made in his likeness. And God has not chosen you as an ornament, as something to be placed on a shelf to admire. The only true and living God has chosen you so that you may know him, so that you may have a living relationship with him now and forever. And God's love is not a whim. It's not a fancy. It is not something that happens by chance. It is not a lottery. It is his sovereign, unchangeable will at work in us. His love, like his mercy, is from everlasting to everlasting. Listen to how God proclaimed himself before Moses in Exodus, when Moses was placed in the cleft of the rock. God passed by and said, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keep in steadfast love for thousands. God's love is absolute and perfect. He cannot love more, nor can he love less. And likewise, his choice is perfect. And those whom he chooses, he will perfect. But chosen for what? Well, Peter tells us that we have been chosen for obedience, and for sprinkling with the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a direct reference to Exodus. Exodus chapter 24, we are told, Moses took the book of the covenant and read it to all Israel. They responded, in turn, the people of Israel, saying, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And then Moses took the blood of the sacrifices and sprinkled it on the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to all the words read to you. And that was the Mosaic covenant, which was God's promise to Israel that he would be their God. He would lead them, guide them, guard them, protect them, and provide them with the promised land a land flowing with milk and honey, and Israel were to enjoy all of this and more. And the only condition they had was that they were to be obedient. And the obedience required was summarized in the Ten Commandments. And then the covenant was sealed with the sprinkling of the blood of the sacrifices and offerings sprinkled on the people. Now this covenant lasted for around 800 years and it was brought to an end by Israel's and Judah's continual disobedience to the word of God, including their unrelenting worship of false gods. But yet even after Israel was exiled, even after they were scattered and Jerusalem was on the brink of, dis, uh, of destruction, God, through Jeremiah, said in Jeremiah 31, 
This is the covenant I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their innermost parts I will write them. And he goes on to say, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now we know that Jeremiah was prophesying of a new covenant, the covenant of grace, the covenant of redemption from sin that was to be sealed in the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only sealed by his blood, but sealed by his obedience to the law, even obedient unto his own death on the cross, thus delivering God's people from the burden of obedience to the law. And in chapter 9 of Hebrews, the writer there tells us and explains that a covenant is like a will, a last will and testament. And it can only come into effect after death. But a covenant is also sealed with blood, shed blood. So just as the Mosaic covenant was dedicated with blood, as described in Exodus 24, with the death of bulls and lambs, so the covenant of grace came into effect by the death of Jesus at Calvary. And if we read on in Exodus and Leviticus, and we find references to, to the sprinkling of blood, the blood of sacrifices at various other times, such as when a leper uh, was healed and had to go for purification. And they would bring an offering to the tabernacle to be sacrificed, and the priest would then sprinkle some of the blood of the offering on the former leper and declare them ritually clean. And they were then allowed to rejoin their fellow Israelites in worship before the tabernacle. And therefore, I think Peter is reminding his readers, and that includes us, that Jesus offered himself once on the cross to bear the sins of many. Through the shedding of his blood, we have access to the covenant of grace and to salvation. And it is through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and the shedding of his blood that we are cleansed from our sin, that we are made acceptable and reconciled to God. Because when we believe, we are considered, we are recognized as being sprinkled with the blood of Christ. And we are therefore included in the covenant of grace. It is, it is important to remember the blood of the sacrificial animals offered in the Old Testament represented only a temporary reprieve from the wrath of God upon sin. Only the blood of Jesus can purge our sin once and for all completely and permanently. So from the very first time we came to believe, the very first time we came before God in the name of Jesus Christ, trusting in faith, trusting in his atoning work of salvation on the cross, we begin, we began the life of obedience. And to whom are we obedient? We are obedient to God because God has chosen us for obedience to himself. And what is obedience? And how are we to be obedient? How do we know if we are being obedient? We don't practice rituals and our faith is in God alone, through Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Believing in Jesus is obedience. Trusting in his death on the cross is 
obedience. Worship in God in the fellowship of believers in Christ is obedience. And as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, walk as children of light, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord is being obedient. And as he says in the previous chapter of Ephesians, chapter 4, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That is being obedient. And Paul also wrote in the first chapter of Romans, through him, Jesus, we have received grace for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ. Seeking to put God first in our lives is obedience. And we seek the wisdom of God through the reading of our Bibles and worshiping together as indeed we are doing now. In order that we may discern his will and glorify him in, glorify him in our lives. And everything we know about being obedient is there in our Bibles. But we also need to grasp the fact that God has not left us alone to struggle, to work out this life of obedience before him and to him. In these opening verses, Peter is stating three truths that are fundamental to our faith. The first we've already looked at, he states that we are elect. We are chosen by God in eternity. And we've also looked at the second, where he declares we are chosen for obedience and for sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And what Peter is stating is that in the eternity of the past, God chose us for salvation in the eternity of the future. So that those of us who believe, we can look back to our election by God the Father and look forward to the revelation of Jesus Christ. To the, when he comes again, when our salvation will be revealed in him. But what about now? What about the in-between? Well, Peter tells us a third truth. He tells us that we are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. After the resurrection, but before Jesus ascended into heaven, Jesus promised the disciples he would send them another comforter, one just like himself. And this comforter is the Holy Spirit that Peter refers to in verse 2. It is the Holy Spirit who brings to us the gift of faith, the ability to believe that God loves us and has chosen us for salvation in Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit of God who makes the calling of God known to us and makes it real to us. It is the Holy Spirit of God who reveals to us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gives us the assurance that our sins have been forgiven and forgotten through the redeeming work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who opens the eyes of our understanding as we read the Bible and as we listen to preaching and teaching of the Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit who enables us to be obedient to the word of God. In all these things, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. And that simply means that he sets us apart. He sets us apart from the world and consecrates us to God. 
Now, this is what is also known as our effectual calling. In the beginning of time, God chose us. But we didn't know that. But there comes a time when God speaks to us through the Spirit in our heart, through his word. And we are born again. We are begotten again into a new life. And we become aware, we are made aware of the mercy and the love of God. And as a result of this spiritual revelation, we begin obedience. We begin to draw away from our old selfish desires and seek our fulfillment in glorifying God. So we are chosen by God for salvation. And this salvation is secured for us in heaven by the redeeming work of Jesus on the cross. And the Holy Spirit works in us to set us apart and prepare us and keep us until the day when Jesus is revealed again, when our salvation is revealed. And so Peter is describing all three persons of the Godhead together, preserving and protecting us so that we are enabled to persevere. Because those who endure to the end shall be saved. And God has determined that we shall endure because it is his will for his people. And you could say, I know it's said in relation to marriage, but what God has joined together, no man may pull asunder. And God has joined us together in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the completeness and perfection of his love. And no man can separate us. Peter closes his statement in verse 2 with a prayer. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Or grace and peace be yours in abundance. And surely all that God has given us is a tremendous testimony of his grace to us. And we very often just read over these words. We say these words, but consider these words. It is a simple yet profound blessing that Peter is expressing for these people. It is a profound desire that he has for them. These people who are scattered, uh, who struggle or perhaps are unable to meet in congregations. And when they did, they would have to travel many miles on foot to meet with each other, maybe to meet with a, a single Christian. But Peter is wishing that they may know and avail themselves of all the fruits of God's love, all the spiritual blessings God bestows on his people, the knowledge of himself, the wisdom to discern the deep things of God, the love to maintain good relationships with fellow Christians, the spiritual strength to seek God in all circumstances. And I have already said that the love of God can neither diminish nor increase toward his people. His love is perfect. But awareness of the love of God an awareness of the abundance of the many ways in which the love of God is revealed can and is multiplied to those who seek his presence. So grace and peace together is a choice blessing. And I read once that the flower of peace grows on the root of grace. We are introduced to peace by grace. We have peace because 
we are reconciled with God. And this fact alone brings a deep stream of peace to our hearts, a deep sense of tranquility. We no longer fear the final judgment because we are at peace with God. We are reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. And Peter is assuring us that the Holy Spirit is at work in us, sanctifying us, and enabling us to endure trials and blessings with thanksgiving, because we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So in closing, I would just want, I just want to make one final observation. Peter begins this letter addressing his readers as elect sojourners. Elect sojourners of the dispersion, scattered throughout the regions of the Middle East. His use of the word elect or chosen is deliberate. They may be scattered and they may be isolated, but they do share a common bond. They share a common identity. In chapter 2, in verses 9 and 10, Peter spells it out even more in case they hadn't grasped what he had been telling them. He writes, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who would not obtain mercy, but now have obtained mercy. If you believe in God, and if you trust in Jesus for salvation, then Peter is describing you. You have obtained mercy. You are not isolated. You are not alone. You are not unknown in a foreign land. You belong to the people of God. And you have a new purpose and a new role to fulfill before him. You are part of a holy nation, set apart to glorify God our Father, who has accomplished all this in you and for you, in the power of the Holy Spirit, through the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray.